Let's look at the first question. Uh, does anybody want to share out how they made it to school as a child? I took the bus, or my parents took me. They let me, for example, they let me walk in sixth grade, but my mom had the habit that she would like drive next to me and drive like, and then like let me walk and then keep an eye on me and it just like, I wasn't feeling it. So like, I just take me, take me. So does anybody want to share their way of getting to school? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Josue Sakara. I just want to introduce myself. Uh, myself. Uh, I'm assistant director with history and social studies for the Boston Public Schools. Uh, I'm in my second year in the position. Uh, a little bit more about me. I am new to the city of Boston. I am from Miami, Florida, but this story, I just feel like it's a real personal connection because I came from a place where students were, were segregated, you know, and ironically, the high school that I went to was actually one of the, the first high schools in the area that was built after, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, and it was a school that, you know, was the intention was to make it a, an integrated school, you know, and and for me, uh, you know, when I when I went to school, it was a school where I it was pretty much like 30, 30, 30. It was you know, 30 percent white students, 30 percent African American students, 30 percent you know, hi, you know Hispanic students. So you know, it's there, you know, race and and, and and culture have always been. A, a, you know, in a conflict with me, and I, I don't remember in middle school uh, when I was a much more ignorant young man that, you know, we would get into a lot of fights between Hispanic kids and, and, and African American kids. And it took me the experience of getting into a big kind of rumble and fight with one of my friends and actually getting hit in the eye with a lock and bleeding and having my mom take me to get stitched up that to me it was just it was stupid you know and it was just pointless you know but I think we need to understand each other's perspectives whether we're in the wrong or they're in the right you know we need to have historical empathy and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do with this this project so I'm going to start my presentation and I'm going to be like I always say technical technical I always have technical issues so, but we're getting around through it. So I have a turn and talk activity. So I want you to take a minute and for some reason the turn and talk activity is not, it keeps turning, I know. Okay, please stay. All right, so and this is in our curriculum. So we've the Boston Public Schools has created a curriculum. Uh, we did it with the 40th anniversary of the Garrity decision last year which encompassed the 2014-2015 school year, and we created uh, lesson plans and resources for students from elementary through middle school and uh, senior high school. So I have two colleagues that work with me, Carrie Dunn, who's our director and uh, is well known in the uh, history uh, circles here in the little greater Boston area. She worked on the high school uh, program and then Natasha Scott, who is the other assistant director, worked on the elementary. I worked on, on the middle school, and it was kind of a, a growing experience for me. So this is for one of our activities. So what I want you guys to just take a minute and, and have some conversation. How did you get to school as a child? Was school close from home or far from home? Did your school reflect the diversity found in your hometown? So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes. And I'll time it and I'll, you know, let's have a conversation. One. And bring everybody back together towards me. What were, let's look at the first question. Uh, does anybody want to share out how they made it to school as a child? I took the bus, or my parents took me. They let me, for example, they let me walk in sixth grade, but my mom had the habit that she would like drive next to me and drive like, and then like let me walk and then keep an eye on me and it just like, I wasn't feeling it. So like, I just take me, take me. So does anybody want to share their way of getting to school? 
Walk. 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 No, no bus? Bus. bus. bus, yeah, bus. Okay. So, yeah, I took the bus. I took the bus my senior year, too. So we were allowed to drive, but I got into a car accident, lost my car, and I had to take the bus my <laughs> senior year. <laughs> Embarrassing. All right. Was it close to home or was it far from home? Close. About a mile. Okay. Did anybody have a track to go to school? I did. Why? I grew up in Springfield, so I was on the outskirts of town, and then the school was more in the central part of the city. So it was about a 30 minute ride or so. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that is, that, that, is a, that is a wow. Yes? I was just sharing in my group that I didn't have a long way to get to school, but for middle school, I could walk to the school I actually went to, but I was cross enrolled because of the way the districting worked in my town. The middle school I was supposed to go to was on the other side of town. So it was a, you know, an interesting situation. A indeed. My parents were able to get me into the school that I wanted to. Indeed, yes, and that's... That's what happens. So we all have different e experiences, you know, and I, something to think about as we, as we go over some of these things today. So I'm focusing on one. There's so many angles and there's so many stories that go with busing and desegregation that you can't just focus on one thing. We've focused a lot more on, on the causes, and I'm trying to bring some factors that are more towards the outside that when we think about it, you know, we, we talk about, yeah, okay, there was discrimination, there was a separate system, but what led to this separate system existing, you know? And what led to the conditions that led, you know, to having a court, federal court order to, you know, balance these schools and integrate these schools. So the, qu the question is, schools in Massachusetts were not legally segregated as schools in other areas of the countries had been. In fact, integration was mandated by law since 1855. Why did Boston public schools have to be integrated through a federal court decision in the 1970s? So we're gonna look at some of the things that, that led to that, you know, and it's just one, one as aspect of, of the story, you know. And I think it's important to look at this because a lot of the time we focus on 74, 75, 76, on the, thro the, the, you know, the, the throwings, on roar, and on all the uproar, you know. And even analyzing and thinking about it, you know, maybe the media was a little bit to blame and not focusing on that there were people that are trying to integrate and there were people that are trying to, you know, bring the schools together, you know. And like, for example, we had a, a teacher PD in August, and one of the interests, when we did a story circle with all the teachers, and some of the teachers that participated in our teacher PD were Boston Public School students during busing, and one, one of them who was a counselor at Eastie, at East Boston High School, talked about, you know, I was in elementary school, and I had a great experience. I got to have an African-American teacher, I learned all these songs, I got to, you know, deal with a new group of students, the, the experience was, was good for me. So, you know, we look at it in, in such a negative sense that I think we have to look at all aspects of it to come together and to and to move along and you know believe it or not there's still people that you know it's it's a it's a wound you know no you're right that the, the media didn't look at all at the yeah. schools that prepared the, the parents worked together and it worked uh, and those, those were all in the city yes uh, they only went where there was trouble yeah I, w I think we, there's a cartoon that I found it was from I think a Canyon College, Canyon Collegian, or, and they basically drew all these kids, and they had all the media cameras and reporters. So aren't you guys going to start fighting, you know? And they're asking that, that question. And that kind of brings that to a perspective. And, and we did an activity with that. That was good. So a little bit about our project. Like I said before, the 40th anniversary was last year. It's history. We need to we cover this. And, you know, we kind of got you know, the, the mayor's office was more open to talk about this and wanted to in include this. So we got, you know, put into the task of creating the, these materials. You know, the desire to have Boston teachers and students learn about their own community. You know, in eighth grade, we're doing Choices in Little Rock, which deals with Southern segregation. And we're looking at Brown versus Board of Education. And we're looking down, down South. But we're not looking at, you know, we had our own struggle here. And, in Boston, you know, and how similar and how different it was. So grappling with the past allows us to move forward. And then another reason that we look at this is our city's demographics are changing every single day that we go move forward, you know. Dominicans have become the largest group of foreign-born residents in the city of Boston. The city of Boston's population keeps on increasing. We have a large Cape Verdean population that has deep roots in the community. We have a, the third largest Haitian 
American population in the United States after Miami and New York. And, and you know, there's a large Chinese community. There's a very dynamic Vietnamese community that has a, a, a story that is remarkable. So, you know, we need to remember this because, you know, we are in a heterogeneous, you know, plural society where we need to un live with each other and understand each other, and, and that's how we, we, you know, we, we build community. And so it's, it's important. Let me just keep turning off. So our resources for, bu for bu busing are here. And uh, we have two places where we teach it at. One is a US civil, civil, we teach civil rights in US history too, and we do it in 10th grade with our high schools. And another area is to complement the choices in Little Rock unit that we do in eighth grade civics, we're doing busing. So I have a lot of material, so I need to move quickly. And I'm going to try to see if I can do this one, and if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. So if you have a phone, if you have a smartphone, if you have a, an electronic device, type up that address or text that address, okay? And you're going to get a question in a second, which it should be here. Okay? So here's a picture here, and I want you to take a look at the picture. And I want you to tell me when you think this photo was taken. So you can give me an exact year. You can give me a decade. You can give me a part of, of a century. Just let me know when you think the photo was taken. And we'll, you know, if you don't have a device or you don't feel like doing a device, that's fine. We can just have a discussion about it too. So it's going to be Paul E.V. Take, I'm going to leave you guys a minute to take a look at the picture. I'm going to go back to the Pole EV really quick. And there's the address that you can go to. So think about the pictures. What's striking about that picture? Very diverse population. Very diverse population, right? Yeah, so kids, it's not, you know, it's not like, like today. <laughs> when you have to remind kids to like, you know, you, your pants are about to fall off or, you know, you need to. <laughs> I will, I'm, I'm not picking up the, the bo boats, but I'm going to, we'll do it just really quickly or early and I'll check back again on it. I'm just, you know, like I said, technology and me, you know, work well so well. So the picture, what do you think it was? 62. We got 62? 60s? 60s? 40s? Okay. That's 30s? 30s? Uh, you sure about that? Okay. Anybody else? 66? Okay. He's actually on the spot. We got this. There's a book on the David Ellis School, <laughs> which I believe is called Inspiring Voices. So it's a book about the David Ellis School, and this picture is a 1936 class picture from the from the David Ellis School. Okay. It's in uh, Roxbury, close to BLA. Yeah. Okay. So we have an integrated school system. That's that's evidence right there. So what goes on? And I think when we want to teach our students, we want to focus. There's you know we always focus on vocabulary words, and it's usually good practice to separate two or three vocabulary words that you're going to focus on in your lesson and pre-teach them. So these two words right here are important to teach when you teach what segregation is, okay? And these are two words that I would separate out. The jure segregation, which is imposed through government mandate, and then there's de facto segregation, which is not mandated by government, but imposed through private choices made by people. So you could say it might not be, I might not be a prejudiced person and I might not be a racist and feel like I'm superior, but through the choices I've made, I have segregated myself and I'm living in, in a neighborhood. So if, if I'm a newly arrived immigrant, it'll probably, you know, and I only speak Spanish, it's going to be easier for me to, my choice, to live in a neighborhood where people are predominantly Spanish because they're going to be able to help me out. And then maybe as I move along and as I get more, you know, upward mobility, uh, you know, 
my kids are speaking English more, I can move to another a place that's more heterogeneous and I get different, you know, people from different cultures. So those are the two, two views. And I had two, two uh, examples over there. That is a white waiting room at, the bus, at a bus station in Memphis, Tennessee, era 1943. And the reason I chose that is because we know that state governments during that time were segregating people and separating people by, by law. So if I was considered colored, I could not go and wait for my bus at that white waiting room without being you know, kicked out or arrested. This one here is from Dimmit, Texas, and it focuses on no Spanish or Mexicans. And Mexicans in Texas had a sort of weird uh, you know, status. They were by customarily segregated by people through custom, but legally they were considered white. So I chose that one because that's a locale that's refusing by choice. It's not a government law that they need to follow. And to put it in perspective, two quotes, one from first you know, African-American woman and be elected to Congress, uh, Shirley Chisholm. The difference between the jury and the fact of segregation is the difference between open forthright bigotry and the shame-faced kind that works through unwritten agreements, real estate dealers, school officials, and local politicians. And I think that's something that we'll see as we try and get other, other uh, and the next one is from you know, somebody that had <laughs> a lot of experience with segregation. Storm Thurman, you know, segregation in the South is open, honest, and above board. Of the two systems of the South segregation, the Northern and Southern, there's no doubt, whatever in my mind, which is better. So he's basically saying, you know, at least we're open about. So this core of segregation, what does it come of? And these are, there's, I think there's several factors, and I think there's things that we need to look at beyond the 73 to 74. And we need to look at discrimination and segregation in housing. We need to look at the movement to the suburbs, conditions of, how and how of housing and the state of schools in predominantly black areas, school committees and tolerance to address the needs of African American children in Boston public schools, and also noting the activism of African American parents and, and particularly mothers, you know? And it, it's, I think it's ironic too that when the court decision was handed down, Parents on the other side took similar active roles, you know, getting their kids out of school, doing, you know, schools on their own, getting together and organizing. Well, yeah. So I'm going to go back to 1933 and talk about a couple of things that I think of, are of note. The Home Loan Owners uh, Corporation, and that was established to help with the issue of foreclosures that was going on in the Great Depression. People were losing their homes left and right. You know, you got soup kitchens forming, long lines. So kind of the last thing, you know, another worry is I'm gonna lose my home. And so to help with mortgages that were near the fault and give homeowners new ones that they could afford. So what they would do is they would buy old mortgages from banks and which banks would get government bonds in return, which is a safe investment. And they borrowed money from capital markets and from the treasury. Tre treasury and about 200,000 homes the corporation acquired ownership of. And they sold from nearly all of them uh, by 1944. And according to that article in the New York Times, uh, from a new deal, a way out of a mess, bringing, thinking of bringing that idea to what was then the, uh, the housing collapse that was going on in 2008, they made a small profit. Did they only pay for it white families? That's what we're going to be, be looking into. They actually did support African American families, but if you have to look at it, the proportion of white families to African American families. So the other thing is the National Housing Act of 1934, which crea helps create the FHA that ensures banks, mortgage companies, and other lenders. And they started in encouraging the construction of new homes or the repair of, in, in, in of Obstruction. That construction of new homes is something that is going to play into this story too. So FHA loans helped a lot of white working class individuals move up and acquire home ownership. But if you were African American, you were subjected to conditions that would segregate you from whites. You could possibly get a loan, maybe your chances weren't that good, but if you're looking to buy in an area that's predominantly white, you're not going to go that way. 
So the whole HOLC loan experience card, for example, looked at race and immigrant status as consideration for loans. Okay, so out of all the loans, African Americans constituted uh, a small percentage of the loans given out. And what I looked at was like numbers around two, three percent in, in areas. Another factor of determined desirability was the concept of redlining. And redlining is basically going to determine who's going to be living where. So these are some redlining maps. One of the activities we do is, is with a redlining map. So I'm going to open one of them. And this is a great tool that I just picked up from uh, one of our great teachers who teaches at the Linden K-8. And he does uses something called I drew, but I think I have it already. So let me go to the I drew. And let's do a quick activity. I don't know if you can see. You can see the outline of the city of Boston. I've circled two places. I want you to just take a look at it and identify the area in blue and in green to the left of the red area and identify what the red area is. Then the second thing is I want you to look at another blue or green area and try to figure out what neighborhood it would be. I'll give you guys about a minute. And if you want to talk with the person next to you, go ahead. I, I need to move fast, so I'm going to give you guys about 10 seconds to take a seat and we'll move it forward. Okay, so let's take a stab at the red area. What do you think? South End, uh, Roxbury. South End, Roxbury, yes. Okay, and I know because the pond's right here, so I live around here, and I know that if I, that's kind of the drive I take to, I think Dudley would be around here, here somewhere. So that's Roxbury. And the green area? Brookline. 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 You got Brookline, you got Newton. You got Wellesley, you can see Wellesley out here, okay? So, down south, there's some blue, I, I, I see Braintree. So, you know, the, you, now you, the, the maps, there's no anything that says anything about race there, but you can start, now you start identifying the condition. If you notice, you know, Roxbury, South End, those are predominantly areas of color. I, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain in a second. The yeah. Now, it doesn't have to do everything with, with race. And I'm going to go, I'm going to move a little forward. And here's the color key. So green areas were prosperous areas. So they were called first grade areas. Okay. These are the areas that you want to, be, are going to be in demand. Whether it's a good, good or bad, you know, real estate cycle. Blue areas are desirable areas. They might have reached their peak, but they're still going to be stable. Anything that's yellow is in decline. So a lot of times it's sparsely populated areas, and it's some, a lot of times it's areas that are bordering black neighborhoods. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to show a map of Miami because I can, explain, I can give more context looking at it, and I, and I think it's, it makes me reflect on how this goes. And then red, which the term redlining comes from, is what you call the fourth grade. And those are areas where things are already, the three, you know, the three things in the, the, the decline is already happening. You're having families that are not, you know, white and low income. So you'll see sparsely built is like this. You'll see underdeveloped here, and you'll see commercial. And that's pretty much like the key for what for Boston looks like. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to show the Miami one. This is the Miami one. So this is where I grew up in, and I circled some places. And if you've ever been to Miami, just north of downtown is an area called Overtown, which is a predominantly African-American area, once very prosperous, but it was killed when I-95 was built into the city of Miami. Over here you have the Liberty, Liberty City area, Liberty Square area, and this was public housing built in the 30s for African-American families. There was white neighborhoods nearby, and a 12-foot wall was built to separate the neighborhoods. <laughs> Down here is... Okay, Co Coconut Grove, which is 
a really nice area, but it, it had one of the first Bahamian neighborhoods in the 1880s was formed here in the city of Miami. Okay, but if you you can but you know if you live towards this area, Coconut Grove, that's prime real estate right now. But it's yellow because it's surrounded by areas. And this right here is Coral Gables, which is you know very rich and one of the more uh, upper com or upper urban communities in, in close to the city of Miami. It's a city on its own. You know, a nickname the City Beautiful. 1934. Okay. One of the interesting things about the city of Miami map and the Boston map that you don't see here, there's something it says here. And it says Negro communities. And they're labeled with a brown cross pattern. So the example of de facto and, and de jure segregation, you know? The Boston map doesn't have that. Uh, so we have, after the war, moved to the suburbs. You know, we all know that the United States won uh, the war, except in the, the Man of High Castle, if you've seen that series. Uh, but, and there was a fear that we were going to go into economic depression. So one of the things that the government worked was giving incentives for, uh, to the returning veterans, and that's where you get the GI Bill. So, you know, you're getting schooling, and you're also getting very low interest loans available for veterans to buy homes. And this, is a, and this parallel of the FHA. So you have the working class moving up through the FHA, and now you have the veterans returning, you know, moving up through schooling and through low interest loans. So the, dec the decade after World War II with the GI Bill, we have a huge number of low cost homes, because this money, if you want to get this money, they want you to buy new, okay? The suburbs, okay? And you have the small looking cape houses, and you have the ranch style housings. So, We have here the affluent middle class live in suburban areas that are far from their work in homes that they own with center yards and where that in urban L standards are enormous. So uh, this was an interesting story. Campanelli Brothers was a company of, made out of from brothers from Brockton and they built an estimated 15 to 20,000 homes in Massachusetts and thousands more in Illinois, Maryland, Florida, and the Carolinas. They bought a lot of surplus war equipment and they put that to use in in construction. Yeah, the homes were, were, were kit homes. So suburban growth. So at the beginning of the 19th century, you know, we start talking about suburbanization. We have, you know, trolley service and sort of rail service that's able to take you out to, to areas a little bit farther away from the center of the city. Okay. There's loan availability. Uh, through the FHA and the VA loans in the, in the mid part of the, uh, of the century. I read this great group by, uh, his name is Philip Rubio, and it's called The History of Affirmative Action, 1619 to 20, 2000. And he gives a little bit of how the policies for the FHA, 5 to 10 percent of a down payment, 30-year mortgages, 2 to 3 percent interest, and then the VA loans was pretty much like a mere dollar, you know? You're getting money handed to you. So what ends up happening, by 1940, third of the population is in suburbs, but then by 1970, most of us are living suburban, okay? But there's inequalities, and for the black veteran looking to take advantage of uh, VA loans, as Rubio states here, they're less likely to find credit from private banks who, without those services, they're basically not going to be able to get a loan. So what ends up happening, credit is less freely available for them. Okay, some do get it, but overall in proportion, many don't. So there's other things that exclude you from deeds, like uh, covenants, property deeds that determine how property is going to be used. And even after Shelley, which which was with after Shelley and Kramer, which basically outlaws the covenants and deeds, then that you know you still have that. So we end up having segregated communities where blacks and whites live, can't live together. You know, block busting helps drive some of those white families out of neighborhoods. You know, white property owners selling their, pri their houses at low prices, fear that, the, oh, you know, there's a black family moving in here, and the price of your property is going to be at this much by the time they move in. So you're better off selling now. So it's panic selling. In the African-American community, you want money. There's ways of getting it. but 
you deal with the issue of predatory lending, unfavorable conditions, high interest rates, you miss a payment, you lose your home, and that keeps African, a lot of African Americans from upward mobility. So how does it play out in Boston? I found an interesting report, and it's called the Report in for, uh, Massachusetts Housing in Boston by the Massachusetts Advisory Committee to the United States Commission of Civil Rights. And what I wanted to point out there was that some of the things that they found in their recommendations and in their findings, okay? And that's word for word what the way the document was, was written. Disproportionately high rent. Uh, the concept of, of ghettos, you know, instances of disease, poor educational facilities. Uh, children exposed to a segregated neighborhood environment, productive of feelings of inferiority. Okay, and this pers persists because there's discrimination prices. One of the things that I found interesting from them, from there, was the MLS and the fact that black real estate agents wouldn't get MLS listings. So they wouldn't be able to see the, the, all the properties that are out there. So that's a, that's a way of segregating them to lead their clients to those only certain properties. Next thing I focus on is I, I talk a little bit about the history of the Boston Public Schools and how it started, you know, and a lot of the w work, uh, I took Professor Allison's History of Boston course, which is phenomenal. And there are three videos in that course in the module on busing and desegregation that kind of give a, a context to this that you need to understand. So he describes as a patchwork of different ideas and trends. And I feel like we're kind of like that a little bit today, you know. And we have our exam schools. The concept of kindergarten originates here. And then the high schools, you know, we have high schools for commerce, for tech, that focus on workforce preparation. And then in the 1900s, you start getting neighborhood schools. And one of the trends was that in the 60s, we're last among uh, metropolitan areas for the high school graduates that went to college. The, the structure of the, four of the school committee, it was an unpaid elected body. It was a body who focus is, is a place where if you know somebody in the school committee, you're going to be able to find a job easier. So job placement and finding jobs, patronage is important. They were all the way south Yeah. The BDR talking about improving schools and having a, you know, schools improve so that we have moved back into the cities and we have young upwardly mobile uh, families moving out. Okay. And then, you know, it, it leads to some of the conditions that are in the, uh, in the schools, you know, overcrowding, double shifts, not an ample supply of, of books. So just, yeah. So th this right here, I just, I'm going to take you guys, yeah, a look at it and just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get to do just three more slides and, and wrap up. So we just talked to the demographics, population increasing, and then, you know, one of the things that I, I, we want to be talking about is, is the, uh, the interest in, in activism and in, in African-American activists, the history of it. And one slide here that was important is that it wasn't just like, you know, 19, this was going on since the 50s. So there was a pattern, of and there's certain things that, Parents did. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Woman should no more take her husband's name than he should take hers. And so I demanded that I be referred to as Mrs. Lucy Stone. And I requested that newspapers and publications treat me the same and call me by that name, though they rarely did. Thus, I am the very first woman in the United States of America to maintain my maiden name when I was married. <laughs>